Good morning from London. The familiar skyline on this dank November morning framed by the London Eye over there on the South Bank. Big Ben and the Palace of Westminster. The leaves still on the trees here as autumn has not yet quite given way to winter. And to the north, Parliament Street and Whitehall and down there in the centre of the street by the Foreign and Commonwealth Office the grey stone of the cenotaph. For a short space, the focus of the nation's attention each Remembrance Sunday. Three words, lest we forget, lie behind the ceremonies being held this morning at countless churches and war memorials and here at the cenotaph as for a moment we try to breathe life into the long list of the dead, to see them as they once were, to think about why they sacrificed their young lives. For many, these great public monuments are the focus for their feelings. But for the families of the bereaved, there may also be a grave to visit, perhaps in one of the huge cemeteries in northern France or in one of 150 different countries. And here in Britain too, often tucked away in remote country churchyards, there are war graves of those who died a long way from home. At Sutton Veeney in Wiltshire, there are 142 tombstones of soldiers from Anzac, the Australia and New Zealand Army Corps. Many of them had survived the bloodiest fighting of the First World War at Passchendaele. They came back to Britain to hospital, weakened by their wounds, and then succumbed to the thousand miles away from home. They're still remembered by the children of the village. On Anzac Day, we make posies and put them on the graves to remember the soldiers. And on Remembrance Day, we do almost the same, except we don't use flowers. We use poppies, laurel leaves and rosemary. The poppies grow in Flanders fields, and they're sort of a sign of peace. And rosemary is for remembrance, and it grows in Gallipoli. The laurel leaf is for honour. Anzac soldiers. They came from a distance. To fight for freedom and independence. They came from a distance. With courage and power. They came from a distance. They came from heat. Away from family. Away from friends. They came from a distance. To suffer in the trenches. To suffer in war. Their injuries brought them to places unknown. They started to recover. Then came the flu. Many died. Few lived. We think that we should um, make posies to put on the graves because their relatives that they had can't exactly come over to England and come and visit. It just wouldn't be fair to forget them because all their hard work would just be forgotten and no one would ever know something about them. There's one um, where the person who died there was only just 16 years old. I have got a cousin who's about 16 and I can never imagine someone of that age going to war. I wouldn't want to leave anymore. <laughs> and I think he just began my life. They came from a distance to suffer for us. We will remember them. Sutton Veeney in Wiltshire, where they'll be holding a service today, as at the Cenotaph in London. On horse guards, assembling since nine o'clock this morning the veterans will be taking part in the march past the cenotaph at the end of the service maybe ten thousand of them two hundred different organizations have applied to the royal british legion to come here today the guards memorial there in the background against st james's park and here the hollow square has formed up to the east an officer and troopers of the household cavalry and beyond them, officers and gunners from the King's Troop Royal Horse Artillery who fire a single round on horse guards to mark the start and end of the silence. The 1st Battalion Grenadier Guards. And to their left, an officer and three men from the Royal Gurkha Rifles. And then the Royal Logistics Corps, the Adjutant General's Corps, the Territorial Army, the Civilian Services, the Police, Fire, Ambulance, Prison Services, the WRVS, the St. John Ambulance and the British Red Cross 
society. And the bands of the Coldstream Irish Welsh and Scots Guards will be playing this morning under the direction of Major Andrew Chatburn of the Irish Guards, playing the traditional music of remembrance. Britannia and now Now the minstrel boy. And on the other side of the hollow square in front of the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, the Merchant Air Service, the Royal Auxiliary Air Force, the men and women of the Royal Air Force, including nurses from Princess Mary's Royal Air Force Nursing Service and the Queen's Colour Squadron from Uxbridge. The Naval Detachment, the Royal Marines, Officers and ratings next to them of the Royal Navy, men and women drawn from ships, shore establishments, from submarines and air squadrons. And also here, as always, the Queen Alexandra's Royal Naval Nursing Service, the Royal Fleet Auxiliary, the Merchant Navy, the Fishing Fleets and Her Majesty's Coast Guard. And now men of Harlech. After the rousing men of Harlech, the mass band stand at ease and the pipes take up the Sky Boat Song.
mass bands will now play Isle of Beauty, David of the White Rock and Oft in the Stilly Night. It's not just two world wars that are being remembered here this morning, but many other conflicts. It's 20 years ago now that the Argentinian forces invaded the Falkland Islands and a naval task force was sent from Britain to recapture them. A hazardous operation transporting the troops 8,000 miles to the stormy South Atlantic. Seven weeks into the war, the frigate HMS Ardent was attacked and sunk with the loss of 22 men and events seared on the memory. Certainly for the first two years or so, uh, I used to have lots of nightmares, I know these other chaps did. Um, and it's very difficult actually ever to have it completely out of your mind when you've got people who are close friends and colleagues who have been killed in that sort of way. I'm so proud of what my husband did. His right fleet air arm, they were with the Lynx um, on the back of the ship HMS Ardent. My son Simon, he was on sick leave. And when he heard that the Ardent was due to go out there, uh, he, he was terrified in case the ship went without him, so he rushed down to make sure he was on the board because he was very proud of his ship. By the end of the, the 21st of May, coming up towards nightfall, uh, we'd been struck by uh, a number of bombs that had exploded, a number that hadn't, and also been hit by cannon fire. The instruction to abandon ship was the hardest thing I've ever had to do in my life. I have to admit, uh, very frightening. One never forgets an event like this. Um, it, it's always with you. You feel a guilt that you've survived. Um, you feel a responsibility to the, the wives and children of, uh, of those people who were, were with you. And about five o'clock, there was a knock on the door. Uh, a serving officer in the Navy came and told me that Simon was missing, and we had to assume, or were made to understand, that he died uh, and been sunk with his ship. And um, uh, that was the start of a very bad time. As a widow of the Falklands campaign, it's with me every day, but I only have to look at my children. And my grandson also has mannerisms that sometimes are similar to his granddad. And I'll do a double take sometimes if my grandson turns to speak to me, because I can see Matt over the last 20 years, at times something will trigger a memory, and you remember it. The, the focus of the November the 11th ceremonies is, is that that is a, a focus when you can really think about it, uh, and remember those people who, who worked, for, in my case, who worked for me, who were very good friends as well, because you become very close-knit in a ship, uh, and you have memories of those people as they were frozen in time, that's the interesting thing about it. Remembrance Sunday is very special because I think of other people, I think of other fathers, and I think of those proud youngsters who join the forces knowing they have to defend their country. And we lend our youngsters to the forces, as I lend Simon to the Navy. The time goes over and the, the pain lessens a bit, the memories don't lessen and the pride doesn't lessen. Pipers of the 1st Battalion Scots Guards now play Flowers of the Forest. As everyone who's on parade here knows, the outcome of battles they've taken part in is often uncertain. And this year is the 60th anniversary of what was generally held to be an Allied disaster in the Second World War. In 1942, in need of a morale-boosting victory, it was decided to conduct a raid from Britain onto the German-occupied French coast at Dieppe. And in one day of the 6,000 troops who set out from Britain, mainly Canadians, over 4,000 were killed, wounded, or taken prisoner. I saw this blow of lights flying through the air, and I'm like, what the... 
going on here? Then I realised if there was bullets going, you can hear them crack over the top. It, it, it was hitting the iron, like bang, bang, hitting the iron. I brought in 106 men, and there were 38 wounded and 28 killed. You don't have any idea what kind of opposition you're going to meet, but you find out when you get there, and you try to give back as good as you got. The Dieppe raid was a catastrophe for which Canadians and British alike paid a heavy price. And next day we had a muster parade and then we got to realise the missing gaps and it was then we really thought for the first time about those chaps that hadn't come back. Never forget. Never. Yes. The trauma. Please, please, give two minutes a year to remember. Now, the mass bands play Elgar's Nimrod.
when I am laid in earth from Dido and Aeneas by Purcell. During this cenotaph service this morning, the High Commissioners of the Commonwealth countries, as always, will be laying their wreaths. But this year, for the first time, the sacrifice of former British possessions in Asia and Africa and the Caribbean, as well as the Kingdom of Nepal, the birthplace of the Gurkhas, is commemorated in a new memorial, just opened by the Queen. It's built in Portland stone. Its four huge pillars stand at the end of Constitution Hill at Hyde Park Corner between Green Park and Buckingham Palace Gardens. From the continents and the countries named here, five million people volunteered for service in the two world wars, all except the Gurkhas, subjects of the old British Empire. cupola of the stone pavilion are inscribed the names of holders of the Victoria Cross and the George Cross. leads out the children and the gentlemen of the chapels royal who will be singing in this service followed by the sergeant of the vestry David Baldwin onto the battlefield the sub-dean of the chapels royal the chapel general of Her Majesty's Land Forces John Blackburn and the Bishop of London the Right Reverend Richard Charters The Major General's procession leaves the Foreign Office. The General Officer commanding London District, Major General Redmond Watt with his Chief of Staff and aide de camp to the Major General. And next the politicians led by the Prime Minister will come and take their place just outside the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. Led by Peter Spurgeon, who's been escorting the Prime Minister out for many years. Tony Blair, the leader of the opposition, Ian Duncan Smith, Charles Kennedy of the Liberal Democrats, David Trimble of the Ulster Unionists, Jack Straw, Secretary of State for Foreign and Commonwealth Affairs, the Speaker and the Lord Chancellor. Former Prime Minister Lady Thatcher, Baroness Thatcher and John Major, standing next to Ian Paisley of the Ulster Democrats, John Prescott, Deputy Prime Minister David Blunkett, Home Secretary Jeff Hoon, Secretary of State for Defence. And now the Chiefs of the Defence Staff, led by Admiral Sir Michael Boyce, who doesn't carry a wreath there on the right. The Chief of the Naval Staff, Admiral Sir Alan West, who we saw a moment ago, who was in command of Ardent at the Falklands. The Chief of the General Staff, Sir Michael Walker. Chief of the Air Staff, Air Chief Marshal Sir Peter Squire. And representatives of the civilian services, Merchant Air Service as well. And now the 47 High Commissioners representatives of the 47 Commonwealth countries who fought in both world wars, nearly 3 million in the first and 5 million in the second. And their veterans have been chosen this Jubilee year for a special appeal to help them in their declining years. Many of them, as they say, soldiers who were fighting for a country they'd never seen and a monarch they'd only heard about.
representatives of the faiths, the Rem Catholic Church, the Chief Rabbi, the Free Church Group, the Buddhist community, the Methodist Conference, the Muslim Council, the moderator of the General Assembly of the United Reformed Church, the President of the National Council of Hindu Temples, the President of the Baptist Union, the Chairman of the Network of Sikh Organizations, the President of the General Assembly of Unitarian and Free Christian Churches, the President of the Council of Christians and Jews, the Salvation Army, and on the far left, His Eminence the Archbishop Gregorius of Thyatira and Great Britain of the Greek Orthodox Church. members of the royal family on the balcony where the Queen Mother stood so often and last year for the last time looking down on the cenotaph. The Duke and Duchess of Gloucester, Princess Alexandra and Commodore Lawrence and Prince Edward and the Countess of Wessex beside him. So with under two minutes until the silence at 11, we wait for the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh. To come out with the Prince of Wales and the Princess Royal and the Duke of Kent to take their place. Edinburgh in the uniform Princess Royal in the uniform of Rear Admiral of Chief Commandant for Women in the Royal Navy. And now Whitehall is quiet as we wait for Big Ben to strike 11 and the King's troop on horse guards to fire one round to mark the start of the two minute silence.
as the last post dies away the queen is handed her wreath and goes to lay it on behalf of the whole nation at the foot of the cenotaph the Duke of Edinburgh in 39 as a Royal Naval Cadet the Prince of Wales who served five years in the Royal Navy as a helicopter pilot in the uniform of an Air Marshal of the Royal Air Force his brother, the Duke of York, is in the Falklands today visiting the British War Memorial and laying a wreath there. And also visited the Argentinian War Cemetery a few days ago. And now the Princess Royal, in the office of, of in the uniform of a Rear Admiral, Chief Commandant for Women in the Royal Navy. She is followed by the Duke of Kent, who served 21 years in the Royal Scots Greys, a field marshal of the British Army, whose father was killed in the war on a mission, on a training mission in 1942. Next, the Prime Minister, Tony Blair, will lay his wreath, followed by other politicians representing their parties. The music, Beethoven's Funeral March No. 1 in B-flat. Prime Minister very well aware in his short period in office of the heavy responsibility of sending British troops into action. He's followed by the leader of the opposition, Ian Duncan Smith, wearing his campaign medals for service in Rhodesia and Northern Ireland. of the Liberal Democrats, Charles Kennedy. The leader of the Ulster Unionist Party, David Trimble. Next, Elvin Clwyd of Plaid Cymru, laying the wreath on behalf of the Nationalist Parties, Plaid Cymru and the Scottish National Party. And now with a wreath made up of orchid and mangrove and myrtle and juniper and snowberry and old father live forever from St Helena. Jack Straw, the Secretary of State for Foreign and Commonwealth Affairs, lays his wreath on behalf of the overseas territories. Now the 
first group of High Commissioners comes forward from Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka and Ghana. India in particular, which had nearly one and a half million people fighting in the First World War, two and a half million fighting in the Second World War. And both Canada and Australia, of course, very large contingents. New Zealand, nearly 200,000 people fighting. And the second contingent from Malaysia and Cyprus, Nigeria, Sierra Leone, Tanzania, Jamaica, Trinidad and Tobago, Uganda and Kenya. Commissioners of Malawi, Malta, which received the George Cross 60 years ago, for gallantry having been as an island under constant bombardment for a year and a half. Zambia, the Gambia, Maldives, Singapore, Guyana, Botswana and Lesotho. Barbados, Mauritius, Swaziland, Tonga, Fiji, Bangladesh, used to be East Pakistan, Bahamas, Grenada, Papua New Guinea, the Seychelles, and the Commonwealth of Dominica. Finally, the High Commissioners of St. Lucia, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Zimbabwe, suspended from the Ministerial Council of the Commonwealth, but still, like Pakistan, a member of the Commonwealth. Belize, Antigua and Barbuda, St. Christopher and ne Nevis, Brunei, Namibia, Cameroon, and the newest member of the Commonwealth, Mozambique. after the representatives of the Commonwealth, the three service chiefs come forward together to lay their wreaths. Representing the Royal Navy, the Army and the Royal Air Force. After them, the representatives of the Merchant Navy and fishing fleets, John Quinn, who's a chief engineer with hovercraft, representative of the Merchant Air Services, Hal Ewing, and the chief inspector of the fire services, Sir Graham Meldrum. And so all the reeds are laid that will be laid in this part of the ceremony, though many more will follow. And in a moment, the Bishop of London will conduct the service. O oh, Almighty God, grant we beseech Thee that we who here do honor to the memory of those who have died in the service of their country and of the crown, may be so inspired by the spirit of their love and fortitude that forgetting all selfish, 
and unworthy motives, we may live only to thy glory and to the service of mankind. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. us, good Lord, to serve thee as thou deservest, to give and not to count the cost, to fight and not to heed the wounds, to toil and not to seek for rest, to labor and not to ask for any reward save that of knowing that we do thy will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Unto God's gracious mercy and protection we commit you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace this day and always. Amen.
the service over, the royal party leaves Whitehall. Bishop of London leads the clergy out. Proceeded with his wand of office by the sergeant of the vestry. It's a short service, it's just after twenty past eleven. But this ritual is so well known now, every year. The same music, the same hymns, the same procession of clergy and politicians and serving officers and the High Commissioners. The faces may change, but no one would change the event itself, as though its very repetition year on year is a comfort to those who mourn, and a solemn reminder of the sacrifices made for freedom. Sacrifices which this year once again may be called upon from the armed forces. A responsibility the politicians going back into the Foreign and Commonwealth Office bear. The High Commissioners of the Commonwealth, who've been handsomely remembered this year, the Chiefs of Staff and the representatives of the civilian services behind them. And the last group left, the representatives of the religious denominations waiting to follow them out. Finally, the Major General's party, the General Officer Commanding London District, the man in charge of all the troops in the London area. trumpet voluntary and it's next the turn of the national president of the Royal British Legion Lieutenant General Sir Roderick Cordy Simpson to march down Whitehall towards the cenotaph and lay this reef the Royal British Legion who's responsible for organizing this march past at the cenotaph he himself was in the 13th 18th Royal Hussars 
He was Chief of Staff of the 3rd Armoured Division and the 4th Armoured Brigade in 88. He was Chief of Staff of the United Nations Protection Force in Bosnia-Herzegovina. Commanded an armoured division in Germany and retired in 1998. And took over the presidency of the Royal British Legion in May 2000. Transport. George Martin, a member of the Old Comrades Association with many campaign medals, leads the procession, followed by the Royal Air Force Association, Mike Brockenshire, the chairman of the Royal Naval Association, with the Anchor Reef, the Deputy Grand President of the Commonwealth Ex Services League, General Sir Edward Burgess, the National Chairman of the Royal British Legion in Scotland and of the Royal British Legion Women's Section behalf of all those veterans, they lay their wreaths. Legion are there waiting to start their march past. And it just has to be a slight reorganization here at the Cenotaph to take the wreath so that they can. And for many people coming here today, it may be the last time they march. It's the 60th anniversary of so many battle honors that some of the veterans associations of the Second World War are now disbanding. Their numbers either too few or their members too frail to continue gathering to remember the dead. It's the last year, for instance, in which Allied survivors of the North African War have been back to the site of their triumph at El Alamein. They met up there with their old enemies from Germany to recall the struggle to win control of this desert land and take command of the eastern Mediterranean and the valuable oil fields beyond. It's, it's rounding off part of my life now. I never wanted to come back before but this being the last one I thought we'd come back and pay my respects to the guys that stood shoulder to shoulder and I'm glad I did for some the visit to the cemetery would be punishing that would be a very sad moment it will and particularly as I have a list of the graves where my own comrades were buried. The unit I belonged to was 400 men strong. Only 36 were able to see Germany once again. There weren't any palm trees or dancing girls or anything like that. It was just open desert. And facing you that there's sand upon sand, millions of flies, great big blow flies and if they bit you, you got what you call a desert sore, a great lump had appeared on it and full of pus and once they broke all that the skin had had a turn into a type of ulcer. To live in the desert isn't uh, easy, you know it, 
to lie in a foxhole, the sun is shining, you don't have anything to uh, foreshadow. Our biggest problem in them days was water, a pint of water a day. So perhaps about four are washing mine, so we can make tea with us. We respected your soldiers and it was ordered by us to divide the last piece of water with the Allied soldiers. But whenever any prisoners came forward, we would immediately offer them cigarettes or whatever it was we had. The town of El Alamein was, still is, little more than a railway station and derelict buildings. This was the narrowest point of the Allied front defending Cairo and the Suez Canal, and Rommel's Africa Corps was poised to break through. Winston Churchill, who said he was dismayed by the lack of progress, visited the front and appointed a new commander of the 8th Army, General Montgomery. When Montgomery came out, he made a point of talking to the men. And he always talked in cricket terms. His best 11, his opening bat and all this, that and the other business, and he had particular favourites. And he explained that it was a do or die attempt. And where we were, we stood. After a failed German attack, Montgomery launched the heaviest British barrage since World War I. Someone would whistle all that round, then all the others would give the order, fire. And those marching here this morning who took part in that campaign at El Alamein will remember with pride that church bells rung to commemorate the victory in Britain and that Winston Churchill deemed it to be a, a, an important victory, not the beginning of the end, not even the end of the beginning in those famous words, but perhaps Perhaps the beginning, the start of a series of victories, he said we had only defeats up till then, and after that it was victory. Well now watching with me as these veterans pass by this morning is the military historian John Hughes Wilson himself, a former colonel in intelligence. He served 31 years in the army, he saw service in the Gulf and in Northern Ireland and in the Falklands. And we're watching the association of the RAF regiments who are leading off this year, having, uh, they take it in turns to decide who will lead the parade down Whitehall. Yes, what we've got here is perhaps one of the youngest and most unusual regiments in the British Armed Forces, formed very early in the Second World War to defend airfields, because Churchill had been horrified at how quickly the airfields had fallen in France in 1940. And so the RAF regiment is one of the proudest parts of the Royal Air Force, and one of the toughest. And I remember in Stanley in 1982, seeing gunners of the Royal Air Force regiment up to their waists in freezing water. The Royal Air Forces Association is here, the Royal Observer Corps, the eyes and ears of the Royal Air Force during the war, the Women's Auxiliary Air Force Association. They're led by Ruby Mallinson, their chairman, recruited first into the RAF in 1918 as the Women's Royal Air Force. And then the WAF was formed in the summer of 1939 did all the jobs that the men, uh, men did, they supported as mechanics and balloon and radar operators and telephonists, and plotters and radar, radio operators, drivers, everything you can think of. And the Air Gunners Association. Probably one of the most dangerous jobs I would have thought in the Royal Air Force in the Second World War. Cold, lonely, at the back end of a Lancaster or a bomber, staring into the dark, never knowing if something's out there trying to kill you. The Air Transport Auxiliary Association, the Merchant Service of the Air, is here. Who flew 
transported aircraft bombers and fighters from airfield to airfield. Again, a dangerous job. Federation of Royal Air Force Apprentice and Boy Entrance. British Commonwealth Air Forces Association. There, the Royal Air Force Yatesbury Association. Preceded by the Royal Air Force and Defence Fire Service Association. The Air Sea Rescue and Marine Craft have been passed. The RAF Servicing Command Association, the Royal Air Force Ex Prisoner of War Association, the Blenheim Society, the Pathfinders, and the Seventh Squadron Association of Bomber Command. Who nowadays fly Chinooks and heli heavy lift helicopters. When I was down on Horse Guards Parade earlier, uh, spirits were low, it was pouring with rain, and I think the veterans are very happy to start marching. The Air Gunners Association coming through now, you see uh, these groups twice, once at the top end and once as they come past the Cenotaph. Blesma now. They're smart, bright red wheelchairs. British Limless Ex Servicemen's Association. They're celebrating their 70th anniversary this year. No less than 40,000 men or women lost their limbs in the First World War, and during the two wars it became a very important part of the rehabilitation to look after these people. One of the wreath bearers was injured in the Sicily landings, but also on parade. Major Stephen Hambrook of the Royal Engineers, who lost his leg carrying out mine clearance in the Falklands. The Royal Hospital Chelsea, founded by Charles II in 1682 for veterans who have to be over 65 years old. They used always to be First World War veterans, but no longer. They come from, they come from all the battlefields. I was down on Horse Guards Parade interviewing a man called Cyril Cook, who's an ex colour sergeant from the 1st Battalion East Surreys, and he did three years active service in the Second World War throughout the Mediterranean, fought all his way through, and went into the Royal Hospital in 1996. Led by Brigadier Ross, the adjutant of the Royal Hospital. Giving a smart eyes left as they pass the Senator. They always get a good reception, the Chelsea pensioners. Behind them, Queen Alexandra Hospital home providing a permanent home with full nursing care for disabled ex service And behind them, in those rather smart red and white tops, uh, this is the British ex Servicemen's Wheelchair Sports Association coming by. Uh, very proud and very happy to be on parade again. The Queen Alexandra's Royal Army Nursing Corps Association, celebrating their centenary this year, founded in March 1902. The wreath carried by Edna Smith, who joined them in 1944, went to France and to Belgium. And they serve still. They've been in Sierra Leone, Bosnia, Kosovo, and in Afghanistan. This is yet another legacy of the Boer War the need for good nursing staff, and you could argue that Florence Nightingale's legacy marches on. The ex-services Mental Welfare Society, which is for those suffering from combat stress. Combat stress is something I know a little bit about, and two of the men on parade today. Uh, one is a man badly traumatised, I won't name him, from Northern Ireland, who's had terrible flashbacks, and another man from Korea, People who have the invisible wounds of war, the scars on the mind, which tend to be forgotten. They're followed by the British Nuclear Tests Veterans Association. It's the 50th anniversary of Britain's first test of an atomic bomb at Montebello in 1952, and marching of veterans and widows of veterans who died as a result of radiation exposure. 
And then there are a number of contingents of the Royal British Legion from all over the country, from Cheshire and Derby and Essex and Hertfordshire and Lancashire and Northern Ireland, the Republic of Ireland, Tyne and Weir, Yorkshire, Wales, and the St George's branch, one of the oldest branches of the organisation. And we tend to forget just what kind of contribution the region's made. Uh, quite extraordinary. Uh, something like 49 battalions alone were raised by the Middlesex Regiment. The Fellowship of the Services, saluting now, celebrating their 75th anniversary. Originally just a few ex-servicemen had served in the trenches of World War I. They opened a mess in London and then their work has grown and grown so they now have 8,000 members. Some of the Fellowship of the Services told me they cheat. They come along, David, with their friends and then nip into their old regimental groups to march past. The Princess Royal Volunteers Corps, the Fannies, formed the nucleus of the motor driving companies of the ATS. And some of them joined the Special Operations Executive and commemorated this year their first parachute drop of women behind enemy lines in 1942. And as ever, in this great mass of people marching this whole panoply of the armed services. Apologies to those who may not get a mention, but who are here, it's not possible to mention everybody, but the Black Watch, always distinguished with their red hackles. Very distinctive, berries. the Black Watch, never ever get missed out by the camera. The 42nd of foot, the Royal Highland Regiment, superb. Every year, tremendous display. Regimental pride at its best. And this is my old regiment, the Sherwood Foresters coming through now, David. I served in the infantry before I transferred. Nottinghamshire and Derbyshire Regiment, 45th and 95th foot. Army Commando Association, number three and four army commanders who took part in the Dieppe raid. Just 20 members, and behind them the Suffolk Regiment. Everyone tends to the Cheshires that John was talking about, and the Sherwood Foresters and the Worcester Regiment Association, and the Ulster Defence Regiment Association behind them. And the man in the wheelchair there is Stuart McCall from the Ulster Defence Regiment. He's the first man to go and parade in a wheelchair on the regiment. Well, nobody's going to mistake them. The Association of Wrens they've um, formed in 1920 for those who served in the First World War. The Aircraft Handlers Association. They were responsible for flight deck operations on board aircraft carriers and amphibious ships at sea. HMS Cumberland Association. HMS Cumberland was commissioned for 31 years, the longest serving ship in the Royal Navy, fought at the Battle of the River Plate, and then worked on the Russian convoys. The Lancaster Association, the ship that was downed by enemy fire with such terrible results, a loss of life of 5,000 men, it's thought, off Saint Nazaire. 1940, while evacuating. There's the fleet air arm going by at the moment, that quite distinctive zigzag tie, perhaps one of the most dangerous jobs the lot, flying off aeroplanes, flying off aircraft carriers in the dark. The fleet air arm of Armourers Association, the Submariners Association, led by Ian Tyson. They celebrated their 100th birthday last year. The Algerines Association takes its name from a class of fleet minesweepers. And there was no seaborne landing during World War II which wasn't preceded by the Algerine class of flotillas going in and sweeping the area for mines. Their motto is, we led the way. Hence the famous remark, who sweeps the mines in front of the minesweepers? Perhaps one of the most dangerous jobs of the lot. The 
the VAD Royal Naval Association Voluntary Aid Detachment and then the Russian Convoy Club who escorted parcels of food and clothing for Russia particularly from America and their cargoes going on that perilous, dangerous both. look at the medals very distinctive white hat I've never seen as many medals on a chest I suspect some of those are Russian well, some people are wearing their father's medals or their grandfather's medals as well. The Yangtze incident and the Four Ships Association, it's called, of the Yangtze incident, the moment when an HMS Amethyst was up the Yangtze and was shelled and went aground and had to be relieved. 46 Royal Naval people were killed, 68 injured in that operation. Some of them were killed in HMS London, which went up to try and rescue and was forced back by artillery fire from uh, the coast. It was a very daring escape, the Axe, way back in 1949. Now St Dunstan's following behind the band. There are some distinguished soldiers helping escort them here. Peter Labillier, Edward, Sir Edward Jones, and the marker on the front left of the second, second block, Staff Sergeant Baxter, who served with the Royal Horse Artillery and lost his sight following service in Bosnia. Not all the war blind come from the Second World War. A very good friend of mine who was a Sanders with me is not on parade today. Blinded by an IRA bomb back in 1972 in St Dunstan's ever since. Sometimes the forgotten casualties are peace. Chief Petty Officer Terry Bullingham on the chairman's left there who lost his sight aboard HMS Antrim during the Falklands campaign. read the citation at the start of the Festival of Remembrance this year. This is the South Atlantic Medal Association coming through at the moment. The association representing all veterans of the Falklands conflict in 1982. It's for all, all the services. A very close bond with the men and the people who were down in the Falklands. 200 of them went back to the Falklands to be there for this weekend, as we were saying earlier. Prince Andrew is down there with them as a helicopter pilot who fought during the Falklands War. The Gallantry Medalist League and the Military Medalist League, these great awards of the Burma Star Association, follow the South Atlantic Medal Association. 1942 was a bad year to be in Burma. We were on the retreat all the time, pulling our way back. And to win a Burma star for having been in Burma in 1942 meant you endured almost unbelievable hardship and probably retreated over a thousand miles through the jungle and tough terrain. Medalist League. It was instituted by King George V for bravery in the field in the middle of the First World War in 1916. And in the Second World War, 16,000 of these medals awarded one to Odette, famous Odette, who served as an agent in France and was hideously tortured by the Gestapo. And here you can see the Far East Prisoners of War Association coming through. The left marker of the wreath is carried by Fred Ryle, the Vice President of the National Association of Far East Prisoners of War Clubs. He was in Singapore when the Japanese surrendered and they went down to the docks and HMS Sussex was coming in after the Japanese surrendered to take them off and played Sussex by the sea and he said it was a very emotional, moving experience. They tried to eat some food but they could only drink a little soup. This 
is the six Gurkha rifles we've got coming through here. The National Malaya and Borneo Veterans Association they're part of. So from Gurkha. Gurkha's here, yes. They would have they fought out there. They fought in Malaya. Uh, the first war that was actually fought after the end of the Second World War, the action against communist infiltrators in Malaya, and lots of British national servicemen fought there, as well as uh, the Gurkhas. The National Service Veterans Alliance, marching only for the third time at the Cenotaph, 2,200,000 men were called up into every branch of the armed services and they served all over the place and they now have their own veterans alliance they're led by two officers lieutenants dale johnson ex-royal artillery and dr peter walker who's ex-royal signals and they too um, make sure that nobody will fail to know who they are with those three letters the suez veterans association the Suez Veterans Association have been campaigning. These are, many of them f were on active service in the Suez Canal emergency between 51 and 54. They're campaigning to have a medal. They say they're a neglected force and a, a special committee has been set up to investigate the case for giving them a general service medal. Hasn't yet reported that it was mentioned in the House of Commons last week. Because everyone eight. tends to think of Suez as being 1956, the invasion. Though they too are part of that association. The Aden Veterans Association. They fought in Aden, a conflict which reached its height between 62 and 67, 1962 and 1967. And they're followed by the Canadian Veterans Association, very much with Diet on their minds. And behind here, this parade goes on. The Duke of Edinburgh, the figure with the white cap there, taking the salute with Cordy Simpson beside him, as the veterans who've gone down Whitehall turn round into Parliament Square, come back onto Horse Guards, the Guards Memorial, which they march under, so that though the other members of the royal family all leave Whitehall, go back to Buckingham Palace, the Duke of Edinburgh remains there and takes the salute so that they lay their wreaths here and are then acknowledged as they file back onto horse guards. The 8th Army Veterans Association, led by their General Secretary, remembering El Alamein, of course, which we saw earlier this morning their last march past as an organization. It's not to say they won't be able to come here as individuals. And they're followed by the Black Watch Association. The Ulster Defense Regiment Association, preceded by the Sherwood Foresters, and the little boy proudly wearing maybe his father or his grandfather's medals. The Cheshire Regiment, the Suffolk Regiment, the Armour Commando Association, the Bedfordshire and Hertfordshire Regiments, and the Black Watch. Now here are your six Gurkhas coming into shop nicely now. Very proud that they're the only Gurkha regiment that's marched. It's the second time they've marched and they're hoping that more Gurkhas uh, will march next year at a time when the future of the Gurkhas must be coming uh, a decision. And as ever, smart, proud, determined, the very best of the Gurkha regiment spirit as the six Gurkhas come by. Those very distinctive hats. The Queen Elizabeth's own Gurkha Rifles Regimental Association to give them their full, Correct. full title. <laughs> them the Durham Light Infantry Association and then the Parachute Regimental Association and first army is, is the other army that fought in North Africa and they landed an Operation Torch 
in November, just two or three weeks after El Amain, and they drove hard to the east, and they met Montgomery's 8th Army driving hard from the west. So the 1st and 8th Army fought in North Africa. Also going past here, the Parachute Regimental Association, the Royal East Kent Regiment, the Buffs, the War Widows Association have been passed, the Dun Dunkirk Veterans, the Guards Parachute, the Royal Scots, the Royal Regiment, first of foot. First of foot going through there, the Royal Scots. Past now. They've been preceded by the Queen's Royal Hussars, the Duke of Wellington's Regiment, the Coldstream Guards Association, the Princess of War Re Wales Royal Regiment, the Royal Sussex Regimental Association. And a new field of remembrance of poppies being laid as each contingent brings its wreath. Women's Royal Army Corps Association coming through now, representing Queen Mary's Royal Army Auxiliary Corps, the Auxiliary Territorial Service Corps, and the Women's Royal Army Corps, now of course subsumed into the Army. The Royal Signals Association, responsible for setting up lines of communication. Reconnaissance Corps. Difficult job of probing the front line and finding where the enemy were. The Royal Engineers Association. They are going to be in all the other columns as well as here, Corps of the Royal Engineers. We've seen them as in the apprenticeship colleges. The Army Catering Corps. Tucked away behind the Royal Engineers Association, of course you've got the Royal Engineers Bomb Disposal Branch, which was formed very early in the war to deal with unexploded bombs, and still goes today in 49 Squadron Royal Engineers. The Intelligence Corps Association, you were in intelligence, weren't you? I was indeed, this is the first time they're marching, they're led by John Walmore, who I knew as a sergeant, uh, taking over as a trade course in 1970, and he retired as a Lieutenant Colonel, and heads the Intelligence Corps contingent for the first time on White Hall followed by the Army Physical Training Corps Association, making soldiers as it was put fit to fight. And behind them the Army Air Corps, the second year they've marched, the Royal Flying Corps established in 1912 and the Glider Pilot Regiment in 1942. And then the British Korean Veterans Association, led by their chairman, Colonel Gad, the last serving soldier to leave the Army wearing the Korean War Medal. And we mustn't forget that the Korean War veterans also include those who were prisoners of war for many years in the hands of the North Koreans, particularly cruel brainwashing process. North Korea must have been one of the nastiest wars. I once met a man who had been a prisoner of war for the whole of the Second World War. He'd been called up again in 1948, and in 1949, in 1950, he went into the bag in Korea again. So he spent seven years of his life in a prisoner of war camp. Beachley Old Boys Association, who represent nearly all the trades of the army, uh, from Beachley Camp in Chepstow, and they were taught uh, as apprentices to be blacksmiths and fitters and electricians and carpenters. The Trucial Oman Scouts fought in the Gulf States with that very distinctive red and white shamag over there, a badge of great pride for the Trucial Oman Scouts. Uh, anyone who served in the Gulf is very proud of it. The Chindits Old Comrades Association follows them, trained in commando work behind Japanese lines in Burma, under the command of Major General Ord Wingate. And behind them the Monte Cassino veterans, just 25 of them. And the Foreign Legion Association of the United Kingdom, those who served mainly in the French Foreign Legion, but served in all the spheres of war, Behind them, the Veterinary Corps, the Royal Army Veterinary Corps, and the King's Own Royal Border Regiment. And so the 
services columns have marched past and the civilian columns are now coming towards the Cenotaph. Transport for London, first of all. The London transport have been proudly represented at the Cenotaph ever since George V gave them the honour because of driving their buses to the front in the First World War. Behind them, in the distinctive white caps, the Bevin boys. If you were conscripted in the Second World War, you might go into the armed forces, but equally you could be ordered down the coal mines. And uh, nearly 50,000 of them were conscripted. The St John Ambulance, the Salvation Army, and the Special Constabulary of the Metropolitan Police. They're followed by the National Association of Retired Police Officers and the Evacuees Reunion Association for those who were evacuated when they were young children just formed recently, 1995 Three million people were evacuated during the war uh, put in the charge of long-suffering families out in the country to keep them away from the Blitz there's one wearing the label that she would have been given but they're all wearing the labels that they had just their name on when as young children they left the great cities to avoid the Blitz. It must have been a shock to be parceled up, labelled up and sent away to a strange place, particularly if you came from a town and had to go to the countryside. They're followed by the Association of British Civilian Internees from the Far East, mainly those interned by the Japanese during World War II. Here are the internees coming through and many people remember the famous film Empire of the Sun and everyone thinks of the military prisoners of war but we tend to forget the civilians and the children who were interned and held in captivity by the Japanese for four or five long years. A terrible, terrible deprivation. And marching just behind them, the children and families of the Far East prisoners of war followed by the National Association of Round Tables, which this year has celebrated its uh, 75th anniversary. And the Shot at Dawn organization. And behind them, the Army Cadet Force Association. Marching very smartly, very proud to be in the Army Cadets. The Royal Air Force, the Navy, Sea Cadets. Nowadays we tend to forget just how strong our maritime heritage is. The Navy is not only the senior service, but it was the bastion of Britain's defence for over 300 years. Girls' Brigade, England and Wales, led by the National Chairman, Vivian Etchison. The Scouts Association and the Girl Guides are represented here as well. And the Royal Mail. They were called into service too at the outbreak of war, and 400 or more of them were killed. Women's Royal Voluntary Service follows them. The Land Army, the British Women's Land Army Society, who used to work on the land, the grey, the brown hat rather, and the green coats, who took the place of men who'd gone to war. Sometimes we forget that it wasn't just the Women's Land Army, sometimes women were conscripted to work on canal barges and canal boats, and they probably had the toughest time of all uh, during the war. What memories are they carrying, I wonder? The Boys Brigade, led by the Vice President, and during the Second World War, they worked hard, they provided support to the fire watchers and the auxiliary fire services.
think a number of them were actually dead, uh, decorated for heroism during the war, during the Blitz. The London Ambulance Service, very smart. Again, is the only the second time that these uh, that this this uh, service has been on parade at the cenotaph. It bears out the importance of the civilian emergency services in war and emergency as well, and the contribution they make to the nation. with the church lads and church girls. The Western Front Association, Equity and ENSA, and, and then finally civilians who are just marching on their own account because of members of their family who were lost in war. wear their medals on their right chest. And so as the music still plays, the last of the march past goes down Whitehall towards Parliament Square. We've Remember today people who died in two worlds and in many other conflicts. We've watched as many of those who survived, some of them injured, some frail, some elderly, have paid their respects. We should perhaps also spare a thought though today for those serving in the armed forces now in these troubled times, people who may be called on to fight in new conflicts in Iraq or in the continuing battle against terrorism. Some of the victims of that terrorism were commemorated in New York in September, the first anniversary of 9-11. And in a moving ceremony, their names were read out at Ground Zero. It's a somber thought that if you were to read out the names of all those who died and were remembered here today, and you read continuously day and night, it would take you from now until the last week of December. From the Cenotaph in London, good afternoon.